In this video, we'll be talking about the flexural analysis of a doubly reinforced beams and we'll compare how it differs from the singly reinforced beams. We have already seen for the singly reinforced beams the equivalent stress block uh, will look like this one and the depth of the equivalent stress block uh, we, we are representing just as A1 for now and which is equal to gamma KUT and just for as first beam we are denoting it as KU1 now in this single reinforced beam we have uh, the reinforcement in the tension side the area of the reinforcement is AST and again the dimension of the beams are given here and the neutral axis depth of the neutral axis from the top fiber is let's denote it as DN1 now again T is the tension force in the steel and C is the comp uh, compressive force taken by this compression block. Now we know that if the tensile reinforcement is yielding, then the tension force can be represented as AST, the area of the reinforcement, multiplied by the yield strength of the steel, FSY. Now we know that uh, for horizontal equi equilibrium of the forces, the tension force T should be equal to the compression force C. Now the compression force C, we know that it is the volume of this equivalent stress block diagram which is alpha 2 Fc dash multiplied by B multiplied by gamma Ku 1 D. Now equating these two, we can find out what is the value of Ku 1. So Ku 1 for the single reinforced beam can be represented as ASTFSY divided by this parameter. Now that is for the singly reinforced beam. Now let's look at how it will look like for a doubly reinforced beam. So in a doubly reinforced beam, apart from the tension reinforcement AST, we also have steel reinforcement in the compression side as well. Let's denote the area of the steel reinforcement in the compression side as ASC. Now, the depth of the compression block here, let's denote it as A2, and all other dimensions are remaining the same as a single reinforced beam. And also, the, the depth of the neutral axis, let's denote it as DN2. Now, when we look at the force profile here, we can see that it is the tension force is still taken by the tension steel. The compression block is taking some compressive force, that is, let's denote it as CC, compression force taken by concrete. But apart from that, there is third force as well, because we have another steel at the compression region. That compression steel is also taking a part of that compressive force as well. So the compressive force is now shared by the steel in compression and the concrete block as well. So as this compressive force is shared by the steel and the concrete, the depth, the neutral axis depth will be smaller for the concrete and also the equivalent stress block, this depth A2 will be smaller for A1 as well. We'll see that one later as well. So A2 here is again represented as gamma KU2D and KU2 is the uh, neutral axis depth parameter for the W reinforced section. Now let's see if for a horizontal equilibrium of forces, the tension force should be equal to the summation of the two compressive force here. So T should be equal to the compressive force taken by the steel in the compression and the compression force taken by the concrete block represented by this shaded area. So assuming that the tension force, tension steel is yielding, so we can write tension force as area of steel in tension multiplied by FSY and the compression force taken by the compressive steel in, in compression is area of steel in compression ASC which is denoted by two red uh, circles here multiplied by the stress compressive stress in the steel at present we do not know the compressive stress in the steel so we just write it as sigma SC and the compressive force taken by CC will be denoted in a similar manner as here which is alpha 2 FC dash B gamma KU2 multiplied by the effective depth now if we solve this equation for KU2, that is the neutral axis step parameter, we will see that KU2 is AST FSY minus ASC sigma SC divided by this parameter. So now, if you compare this the neutral axis depth parameter for W reinforced section, compare this with 
the neutral axis that parameter for the single reinforced section. The equation looks very similar. Only difference is that we have on the on here we have ASD FSY minus ASC sigma SC. So by having the compressive uh, reinforcement, we are reducing this numerator, numerator here. That will so that KU2 is actually smaller than KU1 because we have this extra parameter here. So KU2 is smaller than KU1, which means that the neutral axis depth is less for the W reinforced section compared to the single reinforced section. So what are the reasons for providing a W reinforced section? The one, one reason is that what are the advantages of providing W reinforced section? So the creep in concrete, as you know, is the deformation caused in the concrete member where the load is sustained for a very long time. So if the compressive stress in the concrete is sustained for a long time, then it will have larger creep deformation. Now, by having the compressive reinforcement, the part of that compressive force is transferred to the steel. That means the compressive stress taken by the concrete it will be reduced. Now, as the compressive stress reduces, the creep deformation will reduce as well. So one advantage of having a double reinforced section is that the creep deformation, that is the deformation caused by the sustained loading, will be reduced as well because part of it is already shared by the steel. Now, if you look into this graph, this is a mid-span deflection at this point, um, and with as as you can see how it changes with the time. So we are we are keeping the load constant. So as the time increases, let's look at for the first this one. So this graph denotes for rho rho dash equals to zero. Rho dash is the reinforcement ratio for the tension reinforcement, and rho is the tens, uh, reinforcement ratio for the uh, sorry rho dash is the reinforcement ratio for the compression reinforcement and rho is the reinforcement ratio for the tension reinforcement so this is rho dash is basically asc divided by bd now rho dash equals to zero means that this curve denotes the creep deformation for the for the single reinforced beam where there is no compression reinforcement so as you can see as the load is sustained for a long time the deformation is quite substantially high say for 240 days the deformation is nearly six inch here now as we keep on increasing the number of reinforcement in the compression side the reinforcement ratio for the compression side is also increasing so this is the curve when we are providing some reinforcement re reinforcement in the compression side we can see that it is reducing now, when we provide rho dash equals to rho in the compression side, what it means is that we provide the same number of bars in the compression side as, as the tension side, equal number of bars in both tension and the compression side, then as you can see, the creep deformation is quite substantially decreased. Again, for 240 days, the creep deformation is only around 3, whereas in the previous one, it is almost 6 inches. So one of the advantages of having the compression reinforcement is that it reduces the creep deformation. Second advantage is for having a compressive reinforcement is that it improves the ductility of the beams. As we already saw, addition of compression reinforcement reduces the depth of the equivalent stress block, that A parameter. So the effect of that is that it improves the ductility of the beam. Now, this is a single reinforced beam, and the depth of the equivalent block is A1. Compared to that, the depth of the equivalent block for the double reinforced section A2 is smaller than A1, as we saw in the previous, previous slide. So what it means is that for a single reinforced beam, which is already failing in the under reinforced um, failure mode, or that is failing in the tension failure mode, will further improve the ductility by having the compression reinforcement. For example, can you see here in this graph, this is a moment curve as a curve for, for this graph. And as you can see, this the, the bottom most curve, it is for rho dash equals to zero. That means it is a singly reinforced beam, but there are no compression reinforcement in this beam. So it is already a ductile beam. As you can see, there is a clear plateau. 
and there is a large deformation after yielding as well. So there is it, this beam is already a ductile beam. But now if we add the compressive reinforcement, the ductility of this beam will further increase. Now see, if we put the road as that is the reinforcement in the compression reinforcement is half of that of the tension reinforcement. So the reinforcement ratio in the compression reinforcement is half the reinforcement ratio in the tension reinforcement. Then you are you have increased the ductility compared to this one. Now if you further increase the uh, steel in the compression side so that the number of bars, the area of the bars in compression is exactly equal to the area of bars in the tension. That is rho dash is equal to rho. As you can see your ductility has substantially increased compared to the one that doesn't have any single reinforcement. So the conclusion is that for the single reinforced beam which is already failing in a tension failure mode, adding the compression reinforcement will further increase its ductility. It is already ductile but having the compression reinforcement further improves its ductility. Third advantage of having the compression reinforcement is that it changes the the failure mode from compression to tension. So if a single reinforced beam is failing in its compression failure mode, which is a brittle failure mode, and we don't want that kind of failure mode, then if we add the compression reinforcement, that is the steel in the compression side, we can we may be able to change the compression failure mode to the tension failure mode or the desirable under reinforced failure mode. Now for example Let's have a look at this one. This graph is showing that um, when the single reinforced beam doesn't have any compressive reinforcement, this beam is very much brittle. That is, it is an over reinforced beam. So it is failing in a very brittle manner. As soon as it reaches the maximum load, it is immediately failing. Now, if we add compression reinforcement to this beam, we can see that the ductility is improving. When we add half of the comp uh, tension reinforcement in the compression side, the ductility is already improved. And when we add the equal number of reinforcement in the ten compression side as equal to the tension side, the ductility is significantly improved compared to this one. So it is actually changing the failure mode from the compression failure mode to the tension failure mode. So adding the compression reinforcement, the positive effect is that if the beam is failing in compression mode, we can change the failure mode into the tension mode, which is the desirable failure mode. And final advantage of having the compression reinforcement is that it helps the fabrication of the stirrups. So as we said, the stirrups are these vertical reinforcement. It is often called as ties or fitments as well. They are there to take the shear forces. Now having these red compression reinforcement helps to tie up these stirrups or to place the stirrups as well. So that is another advantage of having this compressive reinforcement. If you do not have a compressive reinforcement, you still would need to provide some um, nominal diameter bars to hold these stirrups as well. So to summarize, when do we need doubly reinforced beams? Sometimes uh, the beam dimensions are restricted due to some architectural or other requirements. So for example, if for a car park, uh, the depth of the beam can be restricted so that you have enough clearance for cars to go, go through it. So in that case, your width and the beam, uh, depth of the beam may be restricted by the architects or the designer. But, but if the uh, moment demand is pretty high, if the M star is pretty high, you still need a, to carry that load. That means you will need to increase the reinforcement to meet that moment demand to get that uh, required moment capacity. So for when the BND is already fixed and the moment demand is high and you have to provide large amount of reinforcement, your tension reinforcement will not yield before, it, before the concrete fails. That is the KU parameter is coming greater than 0 0.4 and your beam is in the brittle failure region or the compression failure region. So to avoid this, one of the ways is to change the dimension of the beam itself, the change the BND of the beam. So if you increase the BND, it, it can go into the ductile failure mode. But if BND is restricted, as we said, for the car park, then you cannot change the BND. So the only way to do is that to add the compression reinforcement. 
So if you add the compression reinforcement where the beam is already in the brittle failure mode or the compression failure mode, it will transfer it to the tension failure mode. So that's the way to go. But one thing you need to consider when you are providing a compression reinforcement is that you need to make sure that the compression reinforcement does not buckle. Now, these reinforcements are in tension and the top reinforcements are in compression. So this yellow area denotes the compression area. So looking in the longitudinal view from the other side, so these reinforcements are in tension. These reinforcements are in tension, but the top reinforcements are in compression. So when a slender member is subjected to compressive force, it has a tendency to buckle like this one. And the reinforcement ratio is, the area of the reinforcement are pretty small, so it tends to buckle when it is subjected to compressive force. These reinforcements are in tension, so we don't have to worry about the buckling. It will not buckle. But for the compression reinforcement, as it is subjected to compression, it can buckle. The concrete cover will, pre will try to prevent this buckling, but concrete cover itself is not enough to prevent this buckling failure. So this buckling can cause, cause the spalling of the concrete, which will finally deteriorate the concrete beam. So in this case, we need to, if we are using a compressive reinforcement, we have to make sure that we are using a stirrups of adequate size as per the design standards to prevent this kind of buckling of the compression reinforcement. So as, you, as I said, if you are using a compression reinforcement, you have to make sure that you have a stirrups of adequate size so as to prevent the outward buckling of this reinforcement. And also, uh, the spacing of the stirrups is also uh, limited by the code as well. AS3600 table 10.7.4.3. If you look into this table, you will see that it gives you the minimum size of the stirrups, minimum size of this vertical reinforcement, so as to prevent that outward, uh, outward buckling of the reinforcement, compression reinforcement. So if your longitudinal bars are up to 20 millimeter diameter, the stirrups should be at least six millimeter diameter. So if, so if your bars are 20 millimeter diameter here, the stirrup, the area of the, the diameter of the stirrups should at least be six millimeter. If your bars are 24 to 36 millimeter, if you're using a pretty large bars, then the stirrup diameter should be at least 10 millimeter. And if you are bundling the bars, the stirrup diameter should be at least 12 millimeter. So please keep in mind that if you're using a compression reinforcement, you have to make sure that you are providing stirrups of adequate size and also you are limiting the distance between the stirrups so as to prevent the outward buckling of the reinforcement. Now, we can use the strain compatibility question for the W reinforced beam as well, but there are a few additional terms coming in there. Now, let's look at this W reinforced beam and let's see how we can write the strain compatibility equation for them. So here in this beam, you know AST is the area of steel in tension region. So here we have some additional part apart from the AST. So we have some reinforcement in the compression side as well which is denoted by ASC, area of steel in compression. Now here, the small d is effective depth of this tension reinforcement from the top of the concrete compression fiber. So that is denoted by D. And here DN is the neutral axis depth, which can be represented as KU multiplied by D. And DSC, is the effective cover of this compressive reinforcement. So from the top of the compression fiber to the center of this reinforcement is denoted as effective cover for compression reinforcement. So if you draw a strain profile, it will be exactly the same as that of this uh, single reinforced beam. Only difference is that there is one extra parameter coming here. So that is the strain in the steel in the compression region. So the strain in the steel at the compression re region is denoted by epsilon sc. This is a steel strain in compression. And again, at the ultimate failure load, the concrete crosses at 0 0.003. So your strain in the concrete compression is 0 0.003. And strain at this level in tension is epsilon st. 
Now, if you draw the stress profile, again, it is very similar to that of the singly reinforced beam. So the steel at the tension is taking the tension stress, that is sigma ST. Concrete is taking the compressive stress and we are representing it as an equivalent stress block diagram with the width of alpha 2 FC dash, depth of gamma KUD and the breadth of beam. But apart from that, there is an extra stress coming in here because of this steel. So this steel in compression is taking a part of compressive stress. So that is denoted by sigma SC. So these steel are taking a part of the compressive stress from concrete, which is taken as sigma SC. So if you draw a force profile, so again, there is a tension force taken by this steel. There is a compressive force taken by a concrete but part of that compressive force is also shared by this steel in compression as well so there are two compressive force one for the steel in compression one is taken by the concrete and there is one tension force so you can write the strain compatibility equation for steel in compression and also steel in tension so if you look into um, this small triangle and this big triangle here you can write that epsilon sc divided by this parameter should be equal to epsilon cu divided by this parameter so if you write down equation it will come at epsilon sc equals to 0 0.003 multiplied by dn minus dsc which will give you this length divided by dn which is giving you this one so we are just using this smaller triangle you have to use the effective depth parameter for the steel in strain as well which is dsc so dn is denoting your neutral axis depth and dsc is denoting your effective depth up to the compression reinforcement so this is a strain in compression reinforcement and for the strain in tension reinforcement also we can use a similar triangle this one and the top triangle so that will give you epsilon st here the strain in this one in terms of the strain in the compression this divided by this should be equal to the strain divided by the neutral axis depth. So if you simplify the equation, you have the strain in the tension region denoted by this equation, whereas the strain in the compression region denoted by this equation. So we have two strain compatible equation for a double reinforced section. So we, when we analyze the W reinforced section, as we have two layers of reinforcement, we have to assume which one is yielding first and which one is not yielding. Usually in a W reinforced section, the reinforcement in the tension side is all, most of the time is yielding if it is designed properly. So that means you can start with the assumption that the reinforcement in the tension side is yielding, that is FSY, and but we don't know if the reinforcement in the compression side is yielding or not. For the first assumption, let's assume that both the tension and the compression reinforcement are yielding. That means this steel is yielding, it is stress is equal to FSY, and also in the compression side, the compression steel is also yielding. That means the stress is also equal to epsilon SY, epsilon, uh, FSY. Now, the strain in the tension steel, epsilon ST, is greater than epsilon sy that is it is already yielding and also the strain the compressive stress strain in the steel in compression side is also greater than epsilon sy so both of them are yielding so with that assumption we can solve the value of ku like we did for a single reinforced beam so for a force equilibrium we have to equate the tension force equal to the compressive force. The only difference is that there are two compressive forces here. So the tension force T should be equal to the compressive force CC taken by the concrete plus the compressive force taken by the steel CS. So we can write down the values for all these three forces. So the force T should be equal to area of steel in tension AST multiplied by FSY because we are assuming that both of them are yielding. Again, the compressive force taken by the compressive steel equals to area of steel in compression ASC multiplied by FSY because we are assuming that it is also yielding. 
and the compressive force taken by the concrete it is the same equation that we wrote before now with this equation you can solve for ku so ku equals to area of steel in tension minus area of steel in compression multiplied by fsy divided by this concrete compression parameter so assuming that both of the steel are of 500 megapascal we can take it out and this is what equation you can obtain ku from so once you know the ku you can proceed to find the moment capacity but to proceed to find the moment capacity first you need to check your assumption first so we assume that both the tension and the compression steel are yielding so we need to find out what is epsilon st and what is epsilon sc and to check whether both of them are yielding or not otherwise we have to move to the second mode of failure So you can check the strain in the steel in compression and the steel in tension by using the strain compatibility equation as I described earlier. So strain compatibility equation, you can use what is epsilon SC. You can find what is the strain in here and is it greater than 0 0.0025. And also find out the strain in tension steel and check if it is greater than 0 0.0025. If this both are satisfied, then your first assumption is correct and you can proceed to find the moment capacity. So if the assumption is okay, nominal moment capacity can be obtained now. So there are three forces here. So you can take moment about any of these forces. So let's take a moment about CC, the point of action of CC. So the two remaining forces are T multiplied by this distance which is similar to what we did for the single reinforced one t the tension force multiplied by d minus gamma k u d over 2 so this jet one distance is d minus gamma k u d by 2 plus the comp compressive force in the steel multiplied by this small lever arm here which is given by gamma k u d over 2 minus d c will give you this small arm so gamma k u d over 2 minus d c so this is the moment due to T and this is the moment due to CS. So both of them are acting in an anti-clockwise direction. So you can add it up. The signs are same. So that will give you MU, the ultimate moment capacity of that beam. So you already calculated KU. So you can put it back here to find the ultimate moment capacity of that beam. So what if your this is not satisfied so you started with the first assumption so you started with the assumption that both the steels are yielding and you find out the strain in each of the steel but you find out that this steel is yielding the tension steel is yielding but you found out that the top steel is still not yielding so in that case you have to go for the second failure mode which is represented by here so the second one is your tension steel is yielding and the compression steel is not yielding and you need to find out proceed to find KU so a hint is that if it is a double reinforced section it is it is probably wise to go for assuming that the tension reinforcement is yielding and the compression reinforcement is not yielding so usually that is the case so you don't have to repeat the calculation because you will get it right in the first time itself so if you are assuming that the tension re reinforcement is yielded has yielded but the compression reinforcement has not yielded. So the strain in stress and force profile for this assumption will look like this one. So here, the reinforcement in tension is yielding, that is epsilon st is already get greater than epsilon sy. Concrete has just failed, that is epsilon c is 0 0.003, but the steel in compression has not yielded. That is epsilon sc is still less than epsilon sy it is still in that linear um, linear stress strain curve and it has not yielded yet so if you draw the stress profile for this assumption your steel intention is yielding so you can write it as fsy for that but for the steel in the compression it hasn't yielded so the stress in the compression we don't know yet so we, we denote it as sigma sc so we have the force profile like here. So for equilibrium again, 
the tensile force should be equal to CC plus CS. So you write down what this C is T. So as the tension reinforcement is already yielding, you can write area of steel multiplied by FSY. But the compression steel is not still yielding. So you have to write the area of steel multiplied by sigma SC. So you cannot write FSY because it is still not yielding. But we do not know what is sigma SC. Plus the compressive force is the same like before. So we still do not know what is sigma SC. So but what we can do is that we can write this sigma SC in terms of strain in steel and the Young modulus. See? So you are writing KU here. You are simplifying the equation. And in this term, you do not know sigma SC. All others are known. So to write the sigma SC, you can write it in terms of Hooke's law. That is sigma, sigma is equal to Young modulus multiplied by the strain in the steel. Remember, epsilon S is the Young modulus of steel. So in this equation, we still don't know epsilon SC because epsilon SC is still less than epsilon SY. We don't, do not know the exact value. So what we can do is express epsilon SC in terms of KU again using the strain compatibility equation. So we already have the strain compatibility equation for epsilon SC. Put that back in here so you can represent whole equation in terms of KU. Here, as you can see, so with the strain compatibility equation, putting the value of epsilon SC as this one in terms of KU, you will get a quadratic equation in KU. So you are substituting sigma SC in terms of ES, the Young modulus multiplied by the strain in steel. Then further, the strain in the steel is written in terms of strain in concrete and KU. So now everything is known in this parameter and you can solve for KU. But it is a quadratic equation in KU and you are having pretty large terms so you have to be careful in solving this equation. And then you can find the value of KU if you solve the quadratic equation. So, so solve the second order equation for find KU. So once KU is known, so you can still again find the moment capacity by say taking the moment about CC. You can take moment about any point, but you are taking moment about CC here. So that is the moment nominal moment capacity is T multiplied by this lever arm, which is again D minus gamma KU D by two. Again, A is just gamma KU D over two. And CS multiplied by this small one, which is gamma KU d over 2 that is a over 2 minus dsc so we are just representing um, gamma ku d is equal to a just to reduce the size of this equation and with that uh, again we do not know what is cs the force in compressive force in the steel so you can represent it, it in terms of area of steel multiplied by young modulus of steel and the compressive strain of the steel. By now, you already know the compressive strain of the steel because you have used the strain compatibility equation. So with that equation, you can find the bending moment capacity for a doubly reinforced section.